Welcome back. We're going to continue the, our discussion about imaging of the suprahyoid neck, and we will also take a look at the imaging of the infrahyoid neck. So, continuing with the uh, suprahyoid neck spaces, let's go on and take a look at the masticator space. The masticator space contains part of the mandible, including the ramus and the condyle, the inferior alveolar branch of the trigeminal nerve, muscles of mastication, including masseter medial and lateral pterygoid and temporalis muscles, as well as the pterygoid venous plexus. Superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia envelops this space. Let's take a look at the graphic. Here, we can see in purple, we can see the masticator space, and within it, you will see the muscles of mastication. This is the medial pterygoid muscle, the lateral pterygoid muscle, the temporalis muscle, and finally, the masseter muscle. You can see the condyle and ramus, the condyle and the ramus of the, um, of the mandible. And interestingly enough, just posterior to the medial pterygoid muscle, you will find the alveolar or mandibular nerve. This is the alveolar. This is the uh, branch of the trigeminal nerve that is located just within the fascia. Here on, on this representation, on the axial CT, um, at the level of the nasopharynx, uh, we can see the uh, muscles of mastication, uh, including the medial lateral pterygoid muscles, the temporal temporalis muscle, and the masseter muscle, and the part and the parts of um, of the mandible. Here at, uh, on this slide, this is a coronal graphic uh, through the uh, masticator space um, that shows the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Note that the trigeminal nerve, uh, the alveolar, the mandibular nerve, um, exits the skull base without entering the cavernous sinus. So it exits straight from the mechal scape. It never enters the cavernous sinus. What are the borders of the um, masticator space? Well, let's take a look. Anteriorly, the masticator space is bordered by the buccal space. Posteriorly, there's the peripharyngeal space and the uh, parotid space somewhat laterally, and medially, medially, it also has a margin or the border that it shares with the pharyngeal mucosal space. The differential diagnosis for the masticator space lesions includes osseous lesions, infection, et cetera, because of the presence of the mandible. Sarcomas, are, be, because, uh, are seen in the space because uh, it contains muscles. Lymphoma uh, may also be found in the space. And finally, the peripheral nerve sheath tumors um, may sometimes be seen in the space as well. Moving on to the parotid space. The contents of the parotid space include the parotid gland and part of the duct. Um, some of the lymph nodes are um, often and normally seen within the parotid glands due to late encapsulation during development. Retromandibular vein um, is seen within the parotid and is actually a radiological landmark for the facial nerve, which subdivides the parotid into the super superficial and deep lobes. Branches of the external carotid arteries are found within the parotid space as well. Superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia encapsulates this region. Let's take a look at this graphic and also at the axial CT. Again, we can delineate the parotid space. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's take a look at the parotid space on this axial graphic. You can see that the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia encapsulates the parotid space. The parotid gland is completely encircled uh, within this fascia. We can see scattered lymph nodes. We also see the retromandibular vein, branches of the external carotid artery, and just lateral to the um, 
a retromandibular vein is the expected course of the extracranial facial nerve. On the axial post contrast CT, you can see that the uh, parotid, um, parotid space is seen uh, primarily where the parotid gland is, but also includes this uh, tubular structure, round, actually round structure, which is likely the retromandibular vein. Immediately lateral and posterior to it would be the expected location of the facial nerve. This is a graphic of a generic tumor um, that originated in the parotid space, specifically within this deep lobe of the parotid. How do we know that it comes or originates from the parotid space? First of all, we can see that the peripharyngeal fat is being displaced anteriorly. And secondly, the lesion traverses the stylomandibular gap or tunnel. These are two main signs of a lesion that is coming or originating from the parotid space. The margins or the borders of the parotid space are quite wide. Interiorly, um, it, is, um, it, it has um, a neighboring masseter, spa uh, masticator space, uh, somewhat medially. Um, it shares the margin with the peripharyngeal fat or peripharyngeal space. Uh, medially, there is a carotid space and posterior, there is a posterior cervical space. An important structure that penetrates and supplies and lives within the parotid space is the extracranial segment of the facial nerve. This is a um, sagittal graphic that demonstrates um, an intracranial aspect of the facial nerve that goes through the mastoid, um, through the mastoid bone and exits through the stylomastoid uh, foramen in order to enter into the parotid space where it gives off six branches. You can imagine that lesions that originate within the parotid or parotid space will have great access towards this nerve and therefore will be able to travel via the um, branches of the nerve intracranially. We call this, or we, we refer to it as perineural spread. Another very important aspect of this space is that there is a connection between facial nerve and trigeminal nerve. That connection is mainly supplied by the auricular temporal nerve. Therefore, if there is a lesion that has a predilection towards perineural spread, let's say um, the most common example would be an adenoid cystic um, carcinoma of the parotid gland. If there is a lesion with predilection towards the perineural spread, it may travel up the facial nerve intracranially or it may extend intracranially via the trigeminal nerve. So the auriculotemporal nerve is a very important connection or anastomosis between the facial and trigeminal nerves. And, and serves as a conduit to perineural spread of disease. The differential diagnosis for the parotid space lesions include sal salivary gland tumors, both benign tumors, primary and metastatic malignant tumors, adenopathy, whether it's metastatic, reactive, or lymphoma-related adenopathy can also be found in the parotid spaces. Parotid cysts are fairly common, and inflammation, infectious, and autoimmune diseases are found in the parotid glands and the parotid spaces. And finally, congenital abnormalities of the parotid may also be uh, seen, including agenesis, or perhaps first brachial cleft cysts may be found in the space as well. Venal lymphatic malformation and other vascular abnormality can be found in this space. Moving on to the carotid space. It's a tubular structure that extends from the inferior jugular foramen and carotid canal at the skull base all the way down to the aortic arch. And the bifurcation of the common carotid arteries actually occurs at the level of the hyoid bone. 
The um, carotid space contains carotid arteries, both common carotids and internal carotid arteries, internal jugular veins, cranial nerves 9 through 12, um, as well as the sympathetic plexus. It is important to note that cranial, nerve, uh, cranial nerves 9 through 12 are only seen in the nasopharyngeal, at the nasopharyngeal level of the carotid space. The only nerve that actually spans the entire length of the carotid space um, is a vagus nerve or cranial nerve 10. It runs in the posterior notch form, formed by the ICA and internal jugular vein. And all these structures are enclosed uh, by three layers of the deep cervical fascia. We call that carotid sheath. This is a coronal graphic that is showing um, a relative relationship between different spaces in, in the neck. You can see that the carotid space extends from the skull base all the, all the way to the aortic arch. Interiorly, it is, um, it is uh, abutted by the visceral space and posteriorly, it is abutted by the perivertebral uh, space. It is, as we said, located in both infrahyoid and suprahyoid neck. This is a representation of the um, carotid space. Um, and you can see that just lateral to it is the peripharyngeal fat. Just um, medial to it is the uh, perivertebral uh, musculature, as well as the retropharyngeal space and danger spaces. Let's take a look at this magnified um, picture of the carotid space. Now we can see different contents of the space. Um, so the carotid sheath, as we mentioned, as we mentioned, oh no, sorry. Okay. Let's take a look at the magnified picture of the carotid sheath. It's made, uh, it's made up of all three, uh, three layers of deep cervical fascia. And it contains carotid artery, internal jugular vein, the glossopharyngeal nerve anteriorly, the vagus and the accessory spinal nerve posteriorly, um, and hypoglossal nerve medially um, and anteriorly. Just outside of the carotid sheath, we see the sympathetic trunk. Also remember that the glomus bodies are normally found within the carotid sheath and the bifurcation. What we see on this axial CT um, is um, contrast enhanced structures, and these are uh, your carotid um, carotid artery and, and, jug and internal jugular vein. This is where the carotid space would be found. And different levels of the neck. The carotid uh, space um, has different neighbors. So at the level of the oropharynx, we see that it, um, it's abutted by the retropharyngeal and dangerous space, by the peripharyngeal space, and by the parotid space. Um, a little bit lower down at the level of the base of tongue and the floor of the mouth, we see the carotid space again, um, and the posterior margin is shared with the posterior cervical space, with the, and the medial margin is shared with the perivertebral space, um, and anterior margin is shared uh, with the retropharyngeal and dangerous spaces. And yet lower down in the infrahyoid neck now, this is the carotid space. It is um, just anterior to it, we see the visceral space, just uh, posterior and medial to it is the retropharyngeal and dangerous spaces, and posterior there is a perivertebral space and, and the posterior cervical spaces. As we mentioned, the carotid sheath contains vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is a very important structure. 
And one of the reasons it is important, it supplies multiple organs and provides multiple functions, but it also gives off uh, a laryngeal, a recurrent laryngeal nerves. These are the nerves that supply the larynx and um, play a crucial role in phonation or generation of voice and speech. What's important about the path of um, of the recurrent laryngeal nerves is that it's different on each side. On the left side, the vagus nerve recurs or gives the recurrent laryngeal nerve at the level of the arch. It goes under the um, aortic arch, dives down, goes around, and then ascends towards the larynx. On the right side, so on the left it goes under the arch. On the right side it actually recurs under the right subclavian artery and then it ascends in the tracheoesophageal groove and um, in order to enter uh, in order to um, enter the larynx. So different lesions at different levels will cause um, recurrent laryngeal uh, nerve pathologies. And it is important when we scan to pay attention to, um, to, the, lesion, to the anatomy all the way from the aortic arch and to, uh, from the aortic arch and onto the skull base because this is where the extent, the expected location of the vagus nerve would be, from the skull base to the aortic arch on the left and to the right subclavian artery on the right. So the differential diagnosis for carotid space lesions would obviously would include multiple vascular lesions, including vascular thrombosis, thrombophlebitis, carotid artery dissection and aneurysms. Benign neoplasm could be seen here as well especially peripheral nerve sheath tumors such as schwannoma and neurofibromas, as well as perigangglioma because of the glomus tumors. Lymphoma may be seen here as well, um, as well as the reactive or metastatic adenopathy. Moving on to the buccal space. Um, buccal space is a very interesting um, space that really doesn't do very much except that it creates cheeks and it's located between the buccinator and platysma muscle. It contains mostly fat, but it also contains a distal aspect of the parotid duct. 20% um, of the population also uh, have accessory parotid glands that are located within the buccal space. And then of course, there is a facial nerve, trigeminal nerve and the facial artery within the space. And the fascia that encapsulates uh, this region is the superficial layer of the deep cervical. Um, fascia. The boundaries um, of the buccal space here in yellow, uh, so posteriorly it has a neighbor um, that is the masticator space um, and medially it's bounded by, uh, by the bone, um, whereas uh, laterally you see the zygomaticus uh, muscle, the skin, and the platysma not shown there. The differential uh, diagnosis for buccal space lesions uh, would primarily include parotid duct calculi and associated infection or inflammation, a dentogenic infection, meaning it's the infection coming from the teeth, tumors of minor salivary glands, and vascular lesions such as hemangioma. Moving on to the retropharyngeal space, it's located um, in the midline. Um, posterior to pharynx and cervical esophagus, and it extends from the clivus to the T3 vertebral level. What does it have? Um, its contents um, change depending on the location. In the suprahyoid neck, the retropharyngeal space contains fat, but also lateral no nodes of Rouvier and medial nodes. In the infrahyoid neck, there's fat only and no nodes. Um, the fascia is complicated in this space. The interior uh, margin is provided by the middle layer. The lateral and posterior fascia is provided by the deep layer. And the reflection of the deep layer along the lateral surfaces is called alar fascia. Let's take a look 
at this graphic in the suprahyoid retro of the suprahyoid retropharyngeal uh, space. It contains uh, medial and lateral lymph nodes, and as we said, so we have the medial nodes and the lateral nodes. The anterior margin comes from the middle fascia, middle layer of the deep fascia, and the posterior margin is contributed uh, by the deep uh, layer of, of deep cervical fascia. Uh, this lateral graphic, re again, represents um, the extent of the retropharyngeal uh, space that runs inferiorly uh, from the skull base towards the mediastinum. What's important about this graphic um, representation is, hmm. no, so I'm sorry, we're gonna say this. So let's take a look at this uh, coronal representation of the retropharyngeal and dangerous spaces. Radiographically, we are unable to differentiate the two layers. The danger space is immediately posterior to the retropharyngeal space, but what's important is that um, there is a communication. At the level of T3, there is a so-called trap door with a reflection of the fascia that connects the uh, retropharyngeal and danger space, um, and it allows the extent of any disease into the mediastinum. So T3 is the location of the trap door that connects the retropharyngeal space to the mediastinum. Therefore, disease that occurs in the retropharyngeal space may actually extend into the mediastinal compartments. The borders of the retropharyngeal space depend on the location. So at the level of the um, Oh no, I'm sorry. The borders of the uh, retropharyngeal space include the retropharyngeal space is bordered by the pharyngeal mucosal space anteriorly and perivertebral space posteriorly. The differential diagnosis for retropharyngeal lesions will include infection, phlegmon, and abscess formation, adenopathy, whether metastatic or reactive, and lymphoma. Moving on to the perivertebral space. Perivertebral space is encircled or protected by the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. It is a very strong fascia, and it is very difficult to penetrate. Um, the contents, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a few, a few, a few minutes break. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the paravertebral space. The paravertebral space is divided into the prevertebral and paraspinal components. The prevertebral part, uh, includes the vertebral body and the discs, um, vessels, prevertebral muscles, including the longus coli and longus capitae muscle, as well as the scalene muscles, as well as the brachial plexus and phrenic nerve. The paraspinal component includes posterior elements of uh, the vertebral um, of the vertebra, as well as the paraspinal muscles. And um, this particular space is encircled by deep layer of deep cervical fascia. What's important about this fascia is it's very, very strong and tenacious. It is very difficult to penetrate. Therefore, it forces the infection or tumor from the perivertebral uh, space to be redirected into the epidural space via the neural foramina. So every time that we image a disease that occurs or is centered within the perivertebral space, we need to make sure that it does not extend into the epidural intraspinal space. Also, what's um, interesting is because this uh, fascia is so strong, it acts as a protective barrier 
from um, uh, for any disease that may try to penetrate uh, from the adjacent uh, from the adjacent that tries to penetrate um, perivertebral space from the adjacent spaces. So it's a, it's a great protective barrier. This is a graphic of the perivertebral space, and you can see this is the prevertebral component anteriorly and the larger uh, paraspinal uh, component posteriorly. And again, here, this is a, a contrast enhanced axial CT, and you can see the prevertebral components anteriorly and the paraspinal uh, components posteriorly. The boundaries of the prevertebral space um, include the pharyngeal mucosal space anteriorly and the carotid space uh, laterally, uh, pretty much along its entire course. Um, it extends from the skull base, and some anatomists say that it, uh, that it extends to the clavicles, well, others indicate that it might extend all the way to the uh, inferior sacrum and coccyx. The differential diagnosis for perivertebral face lesions include mostly osseous-based uh, pathologies, including neoplasm metastases or perhaps direct invasion. Infection is implicated as well. Lymphoma may be seen in this space. And of course, the peripheral nerve sheath tumors and uh, pseudotumors. What are the pseudotumors? They include the anterior herniated discs, the vertebral osteophytes, and perhaps longus coli tendon calcification. Finally, we are reaching the infrahyoid neck. Within the infrahyoid neck, we will find the visceral space, the anterior cervical, and posterior cervical spaces. The, let's start by discussing the visceral space. It's the largest space of the intrahyoid, infrahyoid neck and it extends all the way into the mediastinum. It contains the thyroid and parathyroid glands, paratracheal nodes, esophagus, airway, specifically larynx and hypopharynx, as well as trachea, and a recurrent laryngeal nerve. It is surrounded by the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia. The, um, Middle layer of the deep cervical fascia is also called the visceral fascia. This is the visceral space, and you can see the airway. So this is the trachea, the esophagus. Obviously, there is uh, the uh, thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, paratracheal lymph nodes, and the recurrent laryngeal nerves that are running in the tracheoesophageal groove. Here's a representation of the same space on the axial CT. You can see a hyperdense, hyperattenuating, enhancing structure that is the thyroid gland. We can't really see the uh, smaller parathyroid um, glands uh, or um, any lymph nodes. And the boundaries of the uh, visceral space um, are the retropharyngeal and dangerous spaces, as well as the carotid space uh, posteriorly. The differential diagnosis for uh, this space is um, any neoplasm that, um, that may affect thyroid gland, uh, esophagus, or larynx, uh, parathyroid adenomas uh, or carcinomas, and the squamous cell carcinoma. The posterior cervical space is a space that primarily contains fat. It also contains spinal accessory nodes and, this, and the uh, cranial nerve 11 or the accessory nerve. Uh, brachial plexus runs uh, in this space and travels between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. Um, the space is located um, in the posterior lateral neck and extends from the posterior mastoid tip to the clavicle. And this is a, a graphic representation of the 
uh, posterior cervical space. And what's important to note is that the cranial nerve 11 and the scapular nerve are the most, dorsal scapular nerve, are the most important contents uh, of the space along with the spinal accessory nodal chain. Um, and these are the structures that will cause most problems. Um, and that our differential diagnosis would be would be based on um, would be based on these contents. Um, this is a, uh, the per, uh, the posterior cervical space is is um, uh, presented in blue color, and you can, you can see that it sort of it extends all the round. But primarily, oh no 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 I'm sorry. So if I go back, yeah. All right, so from here, this is fine. This is, um, okay. On this slide, we can see that the posterior cervical space is uh, somewhat superficial um, and it's lateral to the paravertebral space. Um, the differential diagnosis for the posterior cervical space lesions um, primarily include lesions arising from the spinal accessory nodal chain. Um, and so what happens um, is that the lesions that occur along the accessory um, nerve may cause the accessory nerve dysfunction. And initially, um, the, it may lead to acute denervation, which is seen as edema and enhancement of the muscles. And it follows by the chronic denervation with muscle atrophy and fatty infiltration. Um, finally, uh, one might develop hypertrophy of the levator's scapular muscle and difficulty lifting an arm. Um, overall, the muscles affected would be the sternomastoid and uh, trapezius. Other lesions that, or other abnormalities that you might see in this particular space will include infection, inflammation, and tumor. And the final space is the anterior cervical space. Um, it's a small infrahyoid compartment. It contains fat and does not have any uh, fascia um, and is not enclosed by fascia. To review, we look to add the suprahyoid neck that contains parapharyngeal, pharyngeal mucosal, masticator product, buccal, and danger spaces. We moved on to the infrahyoid neck and look at the visceral spaces, anterior and posterior cervical spaces. And we also looked at the spaces that traverse both the infra and suprahyoid neck and include carotid space, retropharyngeal space, and paraventibral space. Thank you very much.